and James just walked in. Great. Um, cool. So good morning, evening, depending where you are. Uh, this is implementers call number four for EIP 1559. Uh, there's a couple things we had on the agenda to cover today. First up was just a status update from uh, the different implementing and research teams. Uh, then I think the the biggest part uh, of of I guess meet for the meeting was uh, just trying to figure out what are the next steps and uh, to, to get this eventually deployed on mainnet with the VC as kind of the uh, uh, intermediate milestones to get there. Uh, there was also a discussion of EIP 2718, which is the type transaction. Um, and finally, something that came up on Twitter uh, around just uh, is there ways we can speed up development uh, by adding additional resources? So if people have thoughts, comments on that, uh, we can kind of finish up with those. Um, so first up, let's start with the updates. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first, otherwise I can call on people. I can go first, I don't have uh, much to update really. Great. Uh, so this is Ian from Vulcanize, uh, working on the Go Ethereum implementation. Um, so I guess at this point, my role is sort of just to keep the GEF implementation up to date with the spec as and if it changes. Um, and then also to, you know, make any fixes or changes that need to be incorporated based on the results of the test net that um, the BESO team is running. And so there have been some pretty minor uh, bug fixes. In, in, in those regards, but uh, aside from that, there haven't been any major updates from from my side. Uh, I can go next. Uh, Abdel from Consensus, working on Bezo implementation. Uh, so, pretty same as uh, Jan said. Uh, we are still aligned with the latest uh, specification. We did some bug fixes. And uh, we restarted the testnet, including uh, three get nodes and three Bezu nodes. Uh, so we tried to do some uh, uh, performance uh, tests, were sending a high throughput of uh, transactions, and we found some issues, and they are now fixed. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, last thing, uh, we think that there might be an issue on the spec regarding the base fee. Uh, uh, and we believe we should maybe try to define the minimum value. Uh, otherwise, it can be a problem. And uh, if we let it go to one or even zero way, it can be problematic and it can maybe never uh, go up again. So we can discuss about that later. That's it. Cool. Yeah, let's definitely come back to that. Uh, just, I see Barnabé is also on the call. Uh, do you have an update? Hi, hello. Um, not too much, just keep working on the simulations. A uh, new notebook soon on strategic users. So trying to investigate uh, what happens when you have a sudden spike in demand and users are trying to outbid each other. So trying to add more things to the library to handle this case. And that's it. And giving a shout out to Fred, who's also joining the effort. Uh, maybe I don't know if you want to introduce yourself, Fred. Hey, I'm Fred. Uh, I'm going to be helping out a bit with the agent-based model and implementing a bit of the other behaviors. I worked a bit uh, with this, but in a first price auction, and now adapting a bit of my work towards the AP 159. Nice. Um, great. And I see uh, Thomas and Alexei, you're also on the call. Are there any updates from either TurboGet or, or, uh, or Nethermind? Not for me, sorry, yeah. Okay. I just, the first time I came to the call, it's um, just to see what's going on because it's, um, there has been a lot of, I, I suppose, misunderstandings um, in, the, in the Twitter space specifically. And so I just wanted to get the, just wanted to see if, if anybody would come here to talk about this. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was kind of the last bullet on the agenda. So hopefully we can, we can get to that. Um, Thomas, any updates on your end? Um, yeah, sure. So 
I was mostly spending time on the research side, so like analyzing it, testing different numbers, uh, making mistakes and finding some insight. And I think that maybe within the next two weeks, maybe three, we'll have Nedermind connecting to this, uh, ideally connecting to this Bezil Geth uh, testnet for EIP 1559, so catching up with everything. Um, yeah, it seems it seems very reasonable prediction. But. Cool. Um, did I forget anyone? Did anyone else have an update they wanted to share? Um, maybe we should do an update on the funding group. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, do you want to go ahead, James? Uh, yeah, so we did the Gitcoin grant funding round and had a lot of participation, which was awesome. The funds so far have gone to funding Ian's work on maintaining the Geth project. Uh, the rest of the participants have come from e the EF work. Oh, you, we missed the last bit of what you said, James. Uh, that uh, the other participants have been funded through EF or consensus. Yeah, cool. Just implicitly, like, uh, like you and I and Barnaby and, and uh, Abdul. Cool. Is there, is there some like information about the how how this like some transparency behind how these funds are allocated or so for the Gitcoin grant, uh, we basically the the so it's a public multi-sig, right? Anybody can, can use it. We made it clear we wanted this to pay for research and development of the EAP and not go to people employed by the EF or consensus. Uh, that was kind of the, the high level uh, transparency in terms of like the specific transactions. I think so far, uh, the only one has gone to vulcanize. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. The, um, well, there was one interesting thing that I seen someone posting about um, some, some blockchain, like Ethereum Research Foundation or something like this, uh, posting information about funding the analysis, mathematical and game theoretical analysis of EIP-1559 with some uh, mathematician from, I believe, South Africa. Yes. Uh, yeah, so it's Tim Ruff Garden is the, is the uh, researcher. He's not on the call today. Um, and so this was kind of a single individual who themselves funded kind of this research effort. Um, uh, through, I think, what's called the Decentralization Foundation. Uh, and basically, Tim, is, is, uh, his background is in uh, computer science and, and game theory. And so he's going to work on, on, on doing a formal analysis of 1559 and, and basically comparing it to the current fee model on Ethereum today. Um, and uh, and hopefully, hopefully highlighting you know, some potential improvements uh, or, or some, some, some issues with the EAP. Yeah, this is very exciting. I've seen it. I mean, it looks amazing. Uh, do, does he will he work with Barnaby together? Because I think this uh, this work is somehow um, maybe like um, they would probably help each other. Because on one side we have this mathematical analysis, on the other side we have this more um, of the analysis uh, that is running in the simulations. Yeah, I don't know yet. Uh, we've been talking in the initial stage. Uh, we've had a chat with Team Baco and Team Rough Garden. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I try to stay in touch, and, uh, and I think it's very complementary. I know that he's also planning to publish some open source code, so I don't know uh, how much he will go into the simulations, but I, I, I want to maintain the line with him, yeah. Great, sorry, probably those outside of agenda, <laughs> I'm not talking about. No, no worries. Yeah, it, yeah, and it's worth mentioning, like it is a big, a big kind of stream of work. Um, Good updates. Yeah. Um, so I think it might be worth just like going back to the, the issue uh, Abdel was mentioning with the base fee on the testnet, uh, just to give kind of more light on that. Uh, yeah, Abdel, you wanna share more details on this? Uh, I was not there. Uh, Jan, can you share more details about that? Because uh, I, 
if I remember correctly, you you work on that. Yeah. Um, so essentially, if the base fee currently the current mechanism, if it ever gets down to zero, it can never go back above zero. Um, that's the hard cutoff. There's also a bit of an issue at other low numbers above zero. For example, at at one, um, the gas usage needs to be nine times higher than the gas limit for it to increase up to two. Um, from two to three, it needs to be five times higher and so so forth. It, there's some sort of function that I haven't actually figured out that's um, that describes this behavior. Right, that sounds about correct. Um... Um, should we define a, a safe minimum value then? Again, I think the thing that we did on the ETH2 implementation of 1559 is to just set the minimum value to be twice, the, either equal to the quotient or twice the quotient. I mean, I guess twice the quotient might be a bit safer. Hmm. Hmm. Because at like I guess at like one where it needs to be nine times higher, just because there's not enough block space, right. that means it's kind of impossible. The other, right? al the other alternative to setting a minimum is set, is um, setting it so that the minimum change is a one in either direction. So like if it's smaller than the target, it's, it always goes down by at least one. If it's higher than the target, it always goes up by at least one. I like that idea more, um, but just kind of intuitively. And so that means in the worst case, you kind of go from one to two to three, and it takes you right. a couple blocks until it starts actually going up. Uh, it'll take right. you, I guess, a bit less than 10 blocks because then you'll be back to the 12.5%, right? Right, exactly. It'll, well, it'll take you an extra, you know, eight blocks, but then uh, going up from uh, eight to um, a million or whatever it is, is going to take a, a, something like a hundred blocks anyway. So uh, I think even longer like 200 blocks. Uh, Mika has a question. How many blocks between one nano ETH and zero, assuming a hundred percent empty blocks? Um, so going between one way and eight way, um, so that's a, fact, a factor of 125 million and one over eight. Um, I think that would be about five and a half steps to do a factor of two and then 125 million is about two to the 27. So 27 multiplied by five and a half, 148 blocks. That sound right? Hmm. I'm sure I give or take a yeah. few. Yeah. Yeah. So does anyone disagree with the idea of having like a minimum increment of one? Yeah, it sounds reasonable. Okay, cool. So let's uh, make an action item to change the spec. Uh, and the implementations that have a minimum increment or decrement of one. Um, and uh, was that kind of the only outstanding issue on the testnet? I know there was like a transaction pool issue as well when we tried to put in a bunch of, of transaction. Um, did that get resolved? No, I, I don't think it has. Uh, maybe Karen can speak to that a bit more. There is a, a branch that I pushed up today that hopefully fixes that issue and okay. is likely just due to uh, yeah. a bug that I introduced on the last update. We will try with this branch and see if the issue is still there. Okay, cool. Um, and those were kind of the two big issues, right? Obviously, that we found so far. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I think this kind of leads nicely into the, the next like agenda item, which was how do we, you know, what are like the intermittent steps to get this eventually on mainnet? Like right now we have this one kind of small private test net, which would has, I think like six nodes on it. It's been really useful to find all these kind of corner cases and, and small bugs. Uh, but assuming that like, 
you know, in the next week or two, the spec gets a bit more stable. Uh, Nethermind is going to be ready to join as well. Um, would, would the next step be kind of a more public test net? Um, and if so, what, what do we want to get out of that? Yeah, I mean, the, on the public testnet side, it's so that people can begin to experiment on the wallet side. Is, it, is that something that we want to get out of it? Or is it more like technical vetting and hoping for more randomness due to user activity? I would say the, the, the second, uh, at least my, my perspective, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, cool. I mean, that, that, that's reasonable. I, I, I think that have spinning up and it's going to be hard to get people to just show up and send transactions that are like semi meaningful if it's not an existing testnet. Um, but someone will probably will. Yeah. And I believe there was a miner on the chat who said they would be willing to supply hash power if it was a proof of work testnet. Because uh, right now the testnet we're running between BASU and GET is a clique testnet. Um, so I think also testing the proof of work is a, is a important part of this. Um, if you're looking for block variants, you can just simulate that with the fund distribution as well and not have to wait for mining, but just as if there was mining. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I, I'm personally concerned that we just test the right code paths. So it, 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 uh, maybe we don't need competitive mining, but we, we do want to test the actual code paths that would be used in production. And you, by code paths, I guess, you, to be clear, you're referring to the, the proof of work, the mining ones, right? That yeah, exa been exactly. Changed. Yeah, okay. Um, and I think, because, yeah, I think that'll, if you get like a small proof of work test net, you're kind of uh, proving correctness. Uh, you know that the e works is intended, which we're you know, in the process of doing on the non proof of work one. Um, and I think the step after that is then uh, trying to go with uh, a, a test net that has a larger existing state uh and seeing you know this performance degrade on that because rick the last time you brought this up on awkward devs i think that was the biggest uh, piece of feedback that you got that like it wasn't clear that clients could process these large blocks um especially with with like uh state access so i feel like that would kind of be step three so like step one is what we have now step two is having maybe an empty proof of work test net uh, and step three is maybe going to fork something like a Robs robston where uh, where we can then get like an existing state and maybe get some tooling uh, get some tooling to to adapt to the EAP. Does that seem like reasonable to people? Um, I, can I just ask a quick question because I I'm I am um, I excuse my please excuse my ignorance, but did uh, does the current implementation imply that the two transaction types we will co coexist or is it is the change to switch to the the new transaction type the 2718 transaction type uh, yeah i mean i suppose that um is um when this eip is implemented will all transactions have to have a, a new format or there will be a possibility to to for old type transactions to be Sent as well. There oh, will right. be a transition period where mm -hmm. both transactions are accepted. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, during uh, a certain number of blocks, 800,000 blocks, and uh, the gas pool available for legacy transaction will decrease uh, on each block. Yeah, okay. and that's it. Yeah. And one thing and that's, that's nice. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say one thing that's nice about that that took me a, a while to understand is because you have the 2x block size, you know, even when it's 50-50, you'll still be able to deploy a contract that would say take up a full block today because you'll just fill half the block uh, with like your legacy transaction or your 1559 transaction. So we're also, even though you split kind of the available 
block space in half between the types of transactions, you're not actually decreasing uh, the uh, the max block size that someone can use. And uh, so based on your experience with the implementation so far, where is the kind of biggest complexity in terms of the code lies? In which part of the code? Uh, personally, I would say maybe um, the handling of different RLP encoding decodings uh, based on the transaction because we don't have the type transaction envelope. But uh, if we make it a requirement for this, it, I think it will become easier. But uh, yeah, to me, it is the pain point of this implementation is about uh, encoding decoding of different types of transactions. I'm also a big proponent for 271A, but uh, for the GEF implementation, I'd say the most complicated area is the mempool, uh, the transaction pool more accurately. Are, are the rules of the transaction pool very different for this IP than for, for the existing transactions? No, not really. Actually, you're just comparing the gas prices between the two types of transactions, but the gas price is derived from the base fee okay. Um, okay. and uh, fee cap or gas premium in the case of the EIP-1559 transaction. So it's it's just a different process of arriving at that value. Yeah, the reason so I'm asking can... this question, yeah, sorry, go on. You're good. Uh, so it's the complexity in the transaction mempool because you then have two transaction mempools with different logic or just because it's altered in new logic? Uh, the, the latter, it's actually a single mempool right now. Um, ordering them all based on the gas price. Gotcha. And we do need to update uh, the implementation to, um, to, to rebase on top of 1.919, which adds the um, deterministic ordering when two transactions have the same gas price. Okay, so the reason I was asking these questions is because my suspicion was that the most complexity would be in the implementation of the transaction pool and therefore, when you previously asked the question, like what would be the, you know, what needs to happen for this to go into the mainnet, I think one of the main things is to basically um, preempt any possible uh, questions or problems that would arise uh, with the um, with this particular implementation. For example, you know, is this uh, code resilient towards any kind of DOS attacks and then tick that box. Yes, it is because of such and such and such, you know, like, uh, could we do any stress testing on this and such and such. So basically, yeah. So I think that would help a lot because then you go into the, the, uh, let's say go Ethereum developers and you'll say, these are the things that we're preempting all the, most of the questions you're going to be asking. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, um, you know, if we roll 2718, which we maybe get ahead of ourselves, because I think that's the next item on the agenda. Um, if we decide to implement that first, that kind of introduces some uncertainty into the, you know, unlimited uncertainty into the mempool, in that there's no real clear defined way to order transactions between all these arbitrary types. Interesting. So it's like on one hand, 2718 helps with the RLP encoding stuff and makes the tran transactions easier uh, to, to manage. But then, uh, yeah, if it makes a transaction pool, which is the other most complicated and bit more complicated, it's not clear. It's a like net win. Um, but sorry. we can say that uh, maybe the transaction pool is a bigger problem than the RLP encoding. Yeah. We can deal with that. This is not clean, uh, but yeah, we can deal with that. Uh, yeah, I just think it's a little underspecified uh, where it's at right now for what we're trying to do. So I think that the spec needs to be cleaned up a little bit in order for us, or completed, frankly, in order for us to really start talking about how it would impact the work that we're doing, uh, to Georgios's point as well. Yeah, and there's a couple comments in the chat. I'll just uh, I'll just read them uh, so 
people not on the Zoom call can see, but uh, Georgia says that uh, 2718 seems too generalized. Uh, do we really want, do uh, we really want, oh, is it important to bundle this with 1559? You could add an optional version field if present and set it to V2 uh, and decode it as 1559 transaction. Otherwise it defaults to the current format. Um, and then Mika says 1559 is one of the transaction types that you want. Uh, and there's a question about whether we need a generalized versioning scheme for transaction. Um, and 2017, 2718 isn't just 1559 transaction. There's a, other a bunch of other transaction types that people are proposing. Um, so given, I guess, yeah, that like the, the transaction pool is kind of the most complicated bit on the get side so far. Um, does it make sense to try and maybe just like specify that uh, somewhere else in the code so that, uh, I, I don't know if the EAP is the right place for it, but uh, just so like, like I said, we can kind of proactively uh, address some of the objections around it. But transaction ordering is not a consensus thing, so. Yeah, I know, but at least just saying this is how we did it and, mm. and kind of explaining that not as not as like as something people have to conform to, okay, okay. but mm. just as something people can kind of critique. And, and uh, it should be added to security considerations in the EIP. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah, maybe just adding something about the transaction pool ordering in the security consideration section and why why the, like you know the potential issues can be mitigated. And uh, although as part of the specification it, in, in this strict EIP sense, it isn't as important in the, in, in the inclusion in a hard fork, it's really important for that discussion. Uh, that might happen more as the, those kind of processes are separating in a different place. I'm hoping my audio is better than it was. It is. Okay, good. So I, I think it's time to start thinking of it as it from not just the, the EIP specification, but the how do we get this through the hard work proposal. And the, another in, the, another comment I wanted to make about this transition period, um, I you know there is a, some kind of number. Was it eight hundred sort of blocks or something or eight thousand blocks? Eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand blocks. Okay. And so where does this number come from? Uh, where does it come coming from? Four months, time for wallets to adapt and change. Is that it? Is that, you know, well, yes. this, is, this, is it, this is it actually. Is this going to be okay? But, or would we need to have another emergency hard fork to postpone this? Because that's how I think it's going to happen. Yeah, so I think that, I, I mean, Alexi, you bring up a, a very salient point. Um, yeah, I think that we need to be prepared for a series, multiple hard forks uh, based on what happens when we don't see, a, you know, a sufficient transition um, from wallet providers, exchanges, and, and what have you, and consequently, um, we don't see the, the shift in transaction volume. Uh, I think that's, to me, that is one of the biggest, to me, that's the biggest risk because we can all as engineers or, you know, have these conversations about these engineering problems, but we don't have any, you know, we can find a path to engineering problems. What do we do if, if like, you know, Omise Go just doesn't change their transaction type and they have Tether, you know, what, what, I think that's a pretty big issue. So originally, when I remember in when we met in 2019, I think was it uh, when we discussed uh, this um, in the in Berlin. So I suggested the, the 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 basically the dual transaction types, and one of the reasons I I did that is because we could monitor the um, the uptake of the second transaction type, and based on this information, to inform when the transition period needs to end. Because what we really want to see is that the, the number of the new type transaction increasing, the number of old type transaction decreasing, 
And then when it gets to a certain threshold, we just say, okay, fine. Now we're going to make that mandatory. Um, I don't know. It's a, do you think it's sensible or some, some, maybe some fundamental issue that uh, makes it a bad idea? I, I think psycho there's a psychological component. I think that there needs to be a hard number and a, and a legitimate threat to motivate people. You have to have a carrot and a stick, frankly. So way back when, uh, the, the stick was we're going to hard fork and the carrot was uh, lower gas costs and the, uh, and the new transaction type. Um, over time, that lower gas cost narrative, uh, you know, people didn't like that idea, which is fine with me. And so this is, we're still trying to figure that out. No, but this, but this is actually quite interesting point is that let's say that if we had uh, two uh, transaction pools, I mean, basically two spaces inside the block, one space dedicated to, let's say they're equal in size, right? Uh, or in gas sort of limit. And one, one part can only take the transaction of the new type and another part can take the transaction of the old type. And then if the, uh, with all being, e with everything else being equal, if we can see that the users of the first type actually have a benefit that was promised by, the, by this uh, EIP, then you can say that, look, these are the transactions in this pool and they are actually benefiting because they have all sorts of benefits that people are promising. If that doesn't happen, that maybe there is something wrong with it. Maybe the modeling wasn't correct. No, but this assumes that the benefits will come even if users have a choice uh, between a first price auction and EIP 1559. Like it's not clear that uh, given the choice between uh, the old transaction and the new transaction, I might want to choose the old transaction sometimes. But if I didn't have that choice, uh, you see what I mean? Like there's not necessarily like an equilibrium where uh, both transactions are, are working at the same time. Like, there could be interactions between the two. No, but this is actually going to be a B experiment because essentially you can look at this as a two different blockchains running for the two different rules, but we are basically just combining them in one blockchain. And then yeah, uh, if testing because you're testing both groups on the same blockchain. So at the end of the day, there's going to be interactions based on the gas price, right? No, that, that, that's, that's true. But you don't, don't you think that model should win in, even in that case? Or does it depend on some sort of uh, co coercion that you have to force everybody to, to stick mm. with, the, with the new rules? Like it might win, but it might not as well. It's not clear to me that uh, in the presence, let's say, of 1559, the first price auction is an unstable equilibrium where uh, little by little you see people migrating to a different format. Like you might have interaction between the two. And I agree with Rick, I think, unless like, you have some sort of psychological deadline where, okay, that's it. Like you don't have uh, the space to do it, then you, you avoid being in this equilibrium in the first place. Mm. But it's an interesting question, actually, like if there are interactions between the two, like what does the theme market look like? Even for the transition period, like it could help um, sort of anticipate what will happen during these 800,000 blocks or however many. Yeah, just, I just saw a question from Mika that he said that the issue that is the tool the developers don't have the same incentives as users. Uh, we need MetaMask, Tether, and et cetera to update since the users can't update without them. So yes, that I thought about it just now, but the, um, given the sort of, I mean, given the fact that uh, this EIP has, uh, has such a wide, wide support, uh, uh, you, you would think that basically, uh, support from from the you from the wallets and stuff would actually be a, a competitive advantage however if uh, the if the basically the benefits are so weak that we're not even sure that this this sort of eip is going to win against the status quo then is it really is it really good or i mean um i it just be, if, even if the first one isn't room isn't uh the benefits being so weak, I don't think is the only explanation for what could happen. Like the interactions of the two uh, could be yeah, complicated. Yeah, and then also, and then also just people not like, uh, like the stickiness of the, of the way that things have been done. So I, I don't think it's fair to say that because there are, there are, there are other reasonable explanations besides 
they're not seeing the benefit. But isn't like one of the, the carrots here kind of block space inclusion, right? So if you have this 800,000, uh, you know, transition period at 400,000 blocks, you go 50, 50, and then under 400,000, it means, you know, more than 50% of the block space is, uh, is for 15, 59 transactions. And at some point, you know, the, the benefit is like, well, if you want a large number of transactions included in the block without raising the base fee, um, then you, you kind of need to support 1559 style transactions. And then this is kind of where large applications, you know, if you're like a Coinbase or a Tether or, or something else, and you actually have a significant amount of on-chain volume, you have a really strong incentive to, to, to use that block space. And, and then the first person to you like it, it kind of creates a race like you want to be the first person to to access that block space so you implement it first um yeah because otherwise i guess after you know the eight hundred thousand block period it's like if you didn't implement this change you can't send transactions to the chain um which seems like a pretty big distance. I mean, the, one of the kind of ways to probably address this, I don't know, is does, does the EIP 1559 fixes the maximum block gas limit or does it not? It no longer does. It's just using the minor set limit now. Okay. So what if you essentially uh, fix the, the old style block gas limit right like forever and then, uh, or maybe just make it so that you can only be reduced, but you allocate all future gas block increases to the new transaction type. And this, in this situation, whenever there is a uh, increase in block size limit, it only increases it for the EIP 1559, which means that the people who did not upgrade, they still have a functionality, but they will have to cram into much smaller space. And so the, 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 that actually probably is going to be enough incentive for people to migrate. This, this is my original suggestion was that we over almost exactly verbatim what you just said. Um, and I think the complexity of the conversation uh, sort of put people off from that. But if we're coming back to it, I'm very strongly in favor of it. Increases or shifts in distribution? Increases. I think we do want to like retire the old version at some point. So like in general, the protocol can't just to kind of keep on incre increasing complexity by adding new types of things forever without removing old things, right? So it's just a question of, you know, like, is it four months or eight or 12 or whatever amount? Hmm. I mean, you can, you can what, what, what I'm saying is that uh, we, you could do these decisions with having some data because we, we, what I don't want to do is that make all decisions before we even know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we can first say that, yeah, we can say that now we're going to fix the, the old, old block size and then we're going to reserve all future increases for the new ones. And then we look back into six months and say, okay, what happened? Did everybody, did anybody still use the old type? And if not, then we say, okay, we're just going to ditch it or something like that. So one, I don't know if we're advocate anyone's advocating for block size increases right now. And so I don't know if there's like much room to grow there. And and two, I mean, if, if there's two distinct spaces of block space, they both will be used because there's going there will be sufficient demand regardless of the fee structure to use both of them. So I, I don't think you're gonna see like the the pre fifteen fifty nine half or portion just, just kind of die because block space is block space to a certain extent. And uh, another another thing to think about, it would be nice if the two markets were actually separated. But what 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 will happen in practice is we have the standard market or the legacy market, and then we have the fifteen fifty nine market. And if they exist at the same time, there's a supermarket that a, that encompasses both of them, of people being able to play against them or not against them. But actually, this is going to be great because that means that people have implemented the new transaction type. They, the, well, the fact that they're going to be arbitraging it. Yeah, but but that will will make the one being adopted versus the other information yeah. not as as useful because you're not seeing you're not seeing the adoption. You're seeing the result of the, of the both markets existing at once and then playing against each other. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that 
what it is not possible for a third party to modify. Let's say if I send the old style transaction, it's not possible for the third party to trustlessly modify my transactions into the upgraded into EIP 1559. It has to be me to create that transaction in the first place. So the only per people who can arbitrage this are the per people who create transactions. And if they do that, it means that they've already upgraded. They can already send the second transaction type. So I don't see, see it as a bad uh, uh, issue. Yeah, so the way that I envisioned it originally was that um, a 1559 transactions always happen first. So, so there's, you know, you double the total gas limit and then you basically make like a sort of like a special block. If you want to think of it like a, the, the block, you know, that much bigger block that double block is split in whatever ratio and um, one, five, five, nine transactions always come in first and then they're ordered uh, based on gas price. And then the old transactions are ordered after that. So if you're if you're in, in some sort of auction, if you're one of these users that's a, you know using so much of the of the gas or what have you, um, you're going to want to switch to one five five nine because you're you're always going to beat who who's ever in the traditional transaction type. So another possible idea would be that um, if we want old style transactions to continue being valid forever, then we just make it valid to include them as being part of the, the 1559 space. And we would just like map the gas price to be the, um, to, um, to the max gas price and like say, just set the bribe to like some standard Route 5 way or whatever. Like it's a bit ugly, but you know, like it would, it, it, Well, it does anyone, do, do we want to, to have those transactions valid forever? Like I think what- No, no, yeah, no, no, right. no, no, I don't think yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, the idea would be that at least we would be able to retire the old, like basically everything about the old rules except for the format, and like we can retire the format later if we, um, when we want. I think I, I would suggest that after a certain amount. So we, um, so what I suggest is to basically do at least two hard forks. In the first hard fork, we um, we do what I just suggested, and then once we get some more information, let's say in six months' time. We, uh, if we see that the adoption is happening, like people are really migrating, and then we can say, okay, after that we introduce we introduce the exponential, uh, not exponential, sorry, the linear uh, sort of shift of the ratio to, down to zero. So over a period of time, the ratio is just simply going to drop to zero uh, of the old transaction type. So and so I don't, I basically suggest not to introduce this uh, kind of cliff edge moment right now, but introduce it after we've seen what happens. Uh, but I don't know. then there's no, there's no incentive for people to adopt 59 in the first hard fork, right? Well, it would only be carrot. It would be that like, if nobody adopts the 1559, then the, ba the base fee on the 1559 side will be tiny and there will, uh, well, and there will just be this space ready for people to claim it. Right, like base, the economic equilibrium is basically that the ratio of adoption is the same as the ratio of uh, the yeah, gas of the gas limits of the two spaces. Right. If you allocate some portion of fifteen fifty nine, it will be adopted by somebody because block space is in high demand. Oh yeah. If that is if that is happening, then this is a good data to say okay. After this, we're going to just go do do the do the kind of cliff edge, not cliff edge, but basically gradual uh, reduction. Of the right. or space for the another order. another another option is have have the gradual reduction start four hundred thousand blocks in because at that point you can have an emergency hard fork turn off if nobody's been using the other half but otherwise you don't have to schedule multiple hard forks. Yes, I was going to suggest something similar to that. So yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I so, understand that. now. Mika is saying that we we consuming too much time on the call, but. I think it's probably worth talking about it because it will make the rollout easier or harder. Yeah, and I think personally, I'm in favor of something that doesn't absolutely require a second hard fork because so this idea of like having the, the transition period only kick in halfway through, I think is nice because it gives, you know, more warning. Although there will be warning by this being deployed on test nets, right? Like, if you look at the, the whole process. Um, but what's nice with having this transition period in the first EAP, it means that at some point it goes to zero 
Worst case, we have an emergency hard fork to push it back. Um, but if it does reach kind of zero block space for all transactions, then the second hard fork is really optional. It's like, do we want to do this to clean up the protocol and make it simpler? Um, but if for whatever reason, like we don't want to do another hard fork on ETH1 or something like that, um, we kind of don't have to. And I, I understand the uh, trepidation towards, it, it looks like somewhat relying on a, an emergency hard fork if we needed it. But I, I would tend to the, if we, if we were able to do something and then say, hey, we can do something if we really need it versus we have to push something, we have to push this six months to nine months further back that the preference of the community would be, we have and we can uh, emergency hard fork. They would rather it us move forward. Well, this is more, uh, I think this is, I guess, a bit more philosophical question about, I mean, my personal view that they, it should be a matter of principle that if you don't, don't, don't touch it, it just keeps working. Uh, you don't have to rely on something happening in the future, but you know other people have a different opinions on that. And what would be so? Just to make sure I understand this, what would be the advantage of having the kind of transition period only kick in halfway rather than linear over the whole time? Right? Are we just saying we give more today? Because another way to achieve that is like you literally plan the hard forks two months later. It's, and, it's and psychological. I mean, you have to, we really, it's a game of chicken, right? I mean, we have to tell people we're going to drive off the cliff or else they're not going to do anything. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. So I think I'm kind of in favor of just having the transition period over the whole, you know, to go from 100% old transaction to 99, 98 rather than just giving this kind of, I don't know, 400,000 blocks of slack, which, which we can get by just delaying the hard fork 400,000 blocks. I, I think it's a question of, uh, we have this evaluation inflection point that I think is very difficult. I think Alexi is, I think it's a good idea that Alexi is suggesting that we, that we have this point where we, as a community, make a decision and decide, well, which way do we go? And I think that, again, from almost like a, a game theory perspective, what we have to say is, okay, we've started the car going towards the cliff and now we can like turn the wheel, but we have to turn the wheel to like stop from going off the cliff or we do nothing at 400,000 blocks and we continue to go off the cliff. So Got it's it. like that kind yeah. of game. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And is there a way we can get, you know, some preliminary data on that, right? Like, obviously, if it's live on a network, then people can start, uh, can, can start kind of playing around with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, what's, you know, is there a way to test this before we get the mainnet, basically? Um, Has anybody looked at Filecoin yet? Like the data that we have already? Well, the, the problem with that is every other example is someone implementing something where they don't, they don't have, you know, billions of dollars literally running on an old transaction type and they need to switch to a new transaction type. I mean, that, for us, there's two separate problems, right? There's the mechanism, there's the new set of mechanisms of 1559, which I think can be verified and reasoned about and are not that you know, that's a pretty well-defined problem. And it looks like other teams have sort of taken this, what we've started here and, and gone off and implemented that. And I think that's fine. And then, and I think that's pretty like well-defined. And then there's the fact that we have to have a transition period because we have so, so many existing users that other chains obviously don't have. And I, I think it's that transition period that really changes the conversation and I think is what gets lost on people is that there's there's a social problem that we have that other teams simply don't have.
Yes, and also you have to project. I mean, we could obviously all argue that, yeah, yes, yeah, so we're going to just give them a, a big stick at the end, and then everybody has to migrate within 800,000 blocks. But it's sort of like you, you have to be a cooperative towards uh, basically everybody else. Um, and I think uh, it's reasonable uh, to introduce this and then they say we're going to do another evaluation and decide how um, quick the, the, the remaining of the transition should be. Because we might find that in four months time everybody migrated and we're just going to say, oh, let's just turn the old thing off. Or if we see that the migration happens slower, uh, you know, the, the, the new transaction types is taken on, but there, like, there is, it takes a bit of time. We can say, okay, let's just do it over next year or something, and we're going to program the, the linear function to to slope down. There, there's also a risk of, um, like, I, I understand the, the the idea of getting data to then support the the decisions on how to turn off or turn down is great. I, I still am not sure that the data that we'll get is going to be very easily digestible or or really really say because it is the the union of two markets there, no, there but will you, always... it will be it will be clearly visible how many transactions of the new type got into the block and how many transactions of the old type got in the block you can chart it and make a little a little chart out of it i don't know why why it wouldn't be clear but if both markets end up having the same gas price which they should yeah. if people are arbitraging you should expect that both would be filled to capacity, right? Like yeah, that means that, that means it's a great result. I mean that the, the, there is adoption of the new type. You can also see which, let's say that yeah. if you think about the, uh, um, you know, with some analysis, you can probably identify kind of the, where the transactions are coming to and from, like what web, like at the moment you have like a lot of websites which uh, inject transactions for users, like all the, uh, whatever you have like AI, uh, you know, lending websites and stuff, stuff like that. So uh, what they do, they, they can just connect to your ledger wallet or what have you, and they create a transaction for you, inject them, blah, blah, blah. And so you can see like, how many of these actually transitioned, uh, but um, because they, you know, the, a lot of transactions will be going into the, into this contract and so forth. They could be some way of estimating uh, you know, whether the adoption is going on or is it just arbitraging happening? Yeah, I mean, assume that the 1559 pool is empty, then base fee should go towards zero. And then I think it will be very quickly like full again, at least until the gas price in, in both pools are, are the same, right? Like the problem is that you don't really have a counterfactual if you have both things living at the same time. Like you'll have... Uh, yeah, you were mentioning like A-B testing, but that's not really what you have because you constantly have this interaction between the markets in the gas price, right? No, but as I said before, that the, 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 um, the arbitrage actually does require you to upgrade. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure and people will have good reasons to upgrade these base fees. Exactly. Uh, okay, so if everybody arbitrages, that, that's already a great result, that everybody upgraded to the new format type. But, but that won't show us who hasn't upgraded. Well... Yes, it won't show us who hasn't upgraded. And, I'm, and I'd like to point out that given the current realities of the chain, you know, the users are not the, the gas, the, the end users, the actual humans who uh, tweet and use Discord are not the largest gas consumers, right? The gas consumption is not really indicative. It doesn't map, you know, there's heavy gas users. There's people using a hundred, a thousand times as much gas as other people. And so those people are obviously going to be optimizing and, and arbitraging. I mean, there are gas arbiters who exist in the market today. They will, be, they will be doing this price manipulation, not end users. And it doesn't matter if there are these gas manipulators out there manipulating the price, even if it's to our mechanistic benefit, if MetaMask doesn't support our change, for example. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we don't really see like the iceberg of transactions on the on the chain yeah i mean if you if you look at the gas consumption right now so number one is probably uniswap right uniswap would be one of the first people to upgrade i'm pretty sure yes i think we could get them to upgrade and i think that this is sort of the conversation is well can we get can we get 
Uniswap to upgrade? Can we get MetaMask to upgrade? Can we get Etherscan to upgrade? Can we get Coinbase to upgrade? If we can get these different community members to upgrade, with a, if we have a process for engaging them, then we can really lower, I mean, we can talk about this risk from a mechanism perspective till we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, someone has to go talk to someone and make sure that they're switching. Well, actually, Mita said that 90% uh, of Uniswap is bots, but that's actually, it's fine because the bots will also upgrade with you. Yeah. And just one thing I'm not sure I understand. Um, so if you don't have a transition period, how do you split the block size? Do you just say, you know, the gas limit is X and whatever type of transactions go in? And there's no, there's no carrot or stick. It's just you can send either type and one block can be 99% uh 1559 transaction and the other can be you know whatever percent i've never seen that proposal explicitly i think i understand your question but i don't know that anyone has ever proposed yeah. what you're describing so i'm not sure what how they yeah. imagine it to work yeah but basically what we're talking about right now right if you remove this transition period um to see what happens on the chain how do you actually allow that right You just, you just have two buckets and then leave them as two buckets and then say, have fun. Yeah, exactly. But, but then for example, how do you calculate the base fee? Um, do you take into account normal transactions to calculate the base fee? You obviously can't do that because then you're kind of, you know, removing this incentive to use 1559 style transactions. Um, I don't know, maybe it's something I'm not understanding well, but no, it no, seems I think, like- I think you, yeah. you just treat them as two different sort of pools and, and you look yeah. at them as a, two different blockchains, I think, um, yeah, in a way. Yeah, I know, it, it seems to me like maybe this actually adds complexity to the EAP, whereas having like the separate like clean buckets makes it simpler, but I'm not sure if that's just from a high level. Uh, uh, my intuition is that you have to have two very clear buckets and if you don't do that. It just doesn't work. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking as well. And then in the chat, there's a couple comments that say you just leave it 50-50 in the like forever. But the challenge there is that's actually more aggressive than the current proposal because the current proposal just uh, the, the current proposal starts at like zero percent fifteen fifty nine and then gradually, you know, gets to fifty fifty. Oh, the current proposal starts at fifty fifty. Well, it doubles the block size and starts at fifty fifty. Got it. Yeah, so there's basically, there's immediate boost in terms of block uh, gas limit. At yeah, the, at yeah. The, after the hard yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought it doubled the block size and started at 100 zero. Sorry, that's my bad. Because if you did that, right, you could, if you, if you doubled the block size, start at still 100% legacy transaction and over time allow more 1559 transaction. Uh, then you get to this 50-50 spot midway through the transition. Um, right. And the, the other option, I mean, I think that there is this sort of desire for engineering parsimony. And I'm sorry, I can't read the chat and listen at the same time. But, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the desire for engineering parsimony where you don't increase the block size. And then, and then what would have to happen is you'd have to ramp in 1559 and then ramp, and then ramp down um, um, the classic transactions, which would basically be throttling potential 1559 adoption, which we don't want to do, which is why we double the, the block size. Got it. Yeah, yeah. So is there, so I guess it's kind of circling back to Alexi's proposal of just leaving it at 50-50 until we get more data, you know, on the on the chain. Um, is there like like the strongest objection to that is basically that it doesn't create an incentive for people to switch. Um, but if people already kind of want to support this, we'll see, we'll see how much I guess organic interest there is for it, right? 
I think it will. It is incorrect to say that there is no incentives to switch because if you did create this extra new bucket, which is the same as the current one, anybody who hasn't migrated, they are actually um, sort of using only half of the space that could be using. So, like all the the new smart people who are implemented the fifteen fifty nine will be using the new new bucket while it's still empty. Yes, I also think that making sure that 1559 transactions simply happen first is a huge, huge, huge incentive that will cause many bots to go to, to apply it, as well as uh, exchanges and, and any number of people. And my, my objection to Alex's proposal is more that the data won't be able to tell us that 1559 was adopted or not uh, because of a lack of counterfactual. So we could set up some kind of experiment, but I think this is not one that would tell us uh, what we want to know. Like there's no way to interpret the data in a sense of, oh, people prefer 1559 to uh, the old style transaction. So I think that that's super important to keep in mind. I, I, I appreciate the technical point there, but I think that the evaluation that has to happen just necessarily because of what you're saying is social. You can't, there is no data on chain that you're gonna look at that's gonna answer this question for you, which is in part why we need to have this thing that Alexi is talking about. If we could just use on-chain data, then we wouldn't need to uh, give this social decision point. But because there is this large social component to the problem, we have to create this decision point where we, where we will not have enough data I mean, where, well, where we can't say uh, positively that the experiment will give us sufficient data. We have to run the experiment, have this inflection point, and then see what happens in the community and actually go out and do the analysis by talking to people as opposed to looking at what's going on on chain. Okay, yeah, I can agree with this. As long as, uh, yeah, yeah, this is fine. And my, my, my objection is that there, there will be people that will adopt 1559 because there will be cheap gas, and though and those early adopters will just run for it. But we we will will there is a large group of people that are slow and won't adapt without some kind of hard limit. And in the end, if if there's an option to keep doing 1559, there are people that will just keep doing it. I'll keep that if there's the option to do standard transactions, there'll be a large long tail of people that don't support it unless there is some kind of hard. And then, yeah, just for, I guess, uh, completeness, Mika had a couple comments in the chat saying his objection to Alexei's proposal is that he doesn't think we'll see, we'll get any usable data from that change, that there's not a scenario where we don't see both bucket fills under the, other than Ethereum usage going to zero. Um, and then what's the objection to just be willing to hard fork away if we see people not adopting? I think so we I can't, guess, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think we just need to set a time. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure I understand Mika's point completely. I, I, I think that Alexi's point sort of encompasses both of the, that, that response. I mean, we have to, we have to set a time so that we can say, okay, we should expect a hard fork here um, uh, to 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 you know incentivize people to be prepared and to to just give people notice. I mean, from my point of view, this is the two different. Um, I mean, it goes back to our disagreements about about let's say a difficulty bomb, because I see the approach with the difficulty bomb actually mirrors what has been baked into this current uh, EIP fifty fifty nine proposal. Is essentially this what I think is kind of insecurity of the developers that, you know, we have to always kind of in, embed some sort of threat or cliff edge just in case that people don't, uh, you know, don't do what we want. Um, instead of saying, yeah, we have a clear roadmap, this is what we're going to do. And we are basically secure. We, say, we, we, we know what we're doing and we are going to do what we're gonna, we're gonna do. And you just basically, if you, you know, if you're with us, you're with us. We don't have to threaten you. And that's kind of my approach to this. And uh, so I don't like creating threats in the future that, you know, if we, you know, if you don't do this, we, we this is going to be hard for it and it's going to kill you or something like that. I, I think the um, difficulty bomb is a great example because I think that what the difficulty bomb has actually demonstrated is that we make empty threats, 
right? I mean, that, that to me is the, is the, to your point, I, I personally believe we should be making threats, but they should be legitimate threats, not empty threats. And so if we aren't going to commit to actually doing the thing, to your point, um, and I guess, and that's also sort of an interesting, again, psychological difference, like, are we threatening people? Or are we just saying that, you know, as the operators of some level, as the, as the architects of the system, collectively, the architects are telling you this is imperative and it must happen. And so the, the architects are going to do everything they can to make it happen, be prepared, or are, or are we going to, as architects, capitulate to people who are, I think we all sort of collectively believe are actually making things worse for everyone else out of either, uh, you know, probably out of more incompetence than malice. And I think that to your, to your point, Alexi, that is exactly like, there's a deep philosophical discussion that we have to answer here. And, and, we, and I think that the difficulty bomb has actually set a precedent of uh, the EF says that something's gonna happen and then it doesn't happen. And that's what I think we have to fight against. Yeah, so, if, so to summarize this basically, if we say that, okay, it's going to happen in four, uh, whatever, 8,000, 800,000 blocks, everybody understand that if people didn't have time to upgrade, we're just going to emergency hard work. Everybody knows that. And therefore, I agree, this is a completely empty threat because it doesn't save any purpose. It just basically creates more work for us to, everybody knows that if somebody puts the pressure, said, oh, we didn't migrate, you're going to kill Ethereum, we're going to do emergency hard work, and it's also going to look quite, quite bad. Um, when, when I'm thinking about it this way, just so I can be clear for myself, I, the, I, am, I am confident that there are people that will wait to the last minute to upgrade. We've seen this with every hard work and every, every yes, you just need, deployment. So there, so there, will, need to, there yes, will be but, people that... So I, but I, you need to I wait till that. they are in the minority and then you can basically get through with it. So you have to make sure that your threats are not empty threats. That's what Rick was saying. But like, if, you know, assuming this is not an empty threat, what's the worst that happens, you know, if uh, we just put in the transition from the start, right? We get to the point where there's no more space for old transactions. Obviously some amount of like, I don't know, altruistic or smart or like, you know, incentivize people have upgraded to 1559 there are some people who are kind of stuck at that point and they can't you know do anything until they upgrade how you know how big of a i, I guess i'm trying to get an intuition for how big of a group that is and and what's the impact on them because it, it, yeah sorry to interrupt it depends on who they are if we yeah. if we you know if someone on this call just sort of like you know, grits their teeth and provides the fork to MetaMask. If someone goes out and talks to Uniswap, if someone goes out and talks to these important, you know, these people and makes sure that they actually, you know, basically hands them the patch, then, you know, maybe there are a bunch of scra stragglers that are irrelevant. You know, I think it, it's really hard to say, um, you know, we have to take a strategy that's much softer uh, Again, to Alexi's point, I, I think we have to just be willing to go out and talk to people and make the change as opposed to sort of decreeing it from on high and hoping that people then listen to our decree. And when you say make the change, it's like, like, I mean, I think it's, it's possible to reach out to people, right? Like James has done it for the hard forks, the cat herders have done it. I'm happy to help with that as well. Um, it gets obviously harder if, you know, we have to implement it for Coinbase and for MetaMask or whatnot. So I, 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 what do you see as like the best or like most effective path there? Well, I, yeah, I usually stop thinking about this problem at right where you ask this question, but I, I think we will actually have to be providing um, forks. To, I mean, when I say we, I mean, I think that anyone who wants to see 1559 implemented and is, and has the means and is on this call also needs to be willing to go out and talk to uh, implementer, you know, implementers of auxiliary services um, to make sure that they implement it as well. You can't just talk to us here and, and think that you're going to accomplish your goal. You're, you're yeah. not.
so that's definitely something we can do like before the next call is just like reach out to various you know large users of the chain and or you know both individual large users and like kind of gateways for a lot of small users like folks like metamask and and, and exchanges and whatnot um and just kind of gauge you know how like where they're at regarding this um and, and that would give us i think some preliminary data around what they think is the biggest uh hurdle how realistic it is how much advance notice you know they need uh yeah um that might be worth looking at uh funding with the with the uh, funding some of that outreach because it's it's just a, it's a lot of um it's a lot more work than i think people realize and having having done this with hardware it is it'll, uh, very high touch to even get a rough spawn most of the time got it which translates into that's a lot of man hours to be able to do yeah yeah, yeah. um and just yeah, to be mindful of time, maybe that's something we can we can take offline. And James, I'm happy to follow up with you and, and Rick also, or anyone who has thoughts about this. Yeah, that's a good call. And yeah. okay, great. So just coming back to the actual implementations, then what do we see as the biggest blocker now? So assume I, I don't think we have enough data to make like a, a big change, you know, the to, to the spec um if if we assume that what we had was good you know was kind of the good uh, conceptual thing it seemed like the transaction pool documenting better the transaction pool issues and, and mitigation was one big action item what are the other things that we can be working on to move this forward Uh, implementer wise, the only other thing that I've picked up is the to update the spec so that the base fee is only incremented um, a maximum or sorry, a minimum of one. And is there value in going and doing test nets, uh, you know, beyond what we have now? Uh, does anyone see value in that? Or do we think that we kind of need this answer to the to the large users um, before we do any of that. I see some value in having a more public test net that uh, we put a bounty on breaking the mempool. Yeah, I think we should do both at the same time. I think we should continue forward with the test nets until we get up to like a Robston level test net um, because I think that we're going to need that anyway to demonstrate seriousness and commitment and for other reasons as well. Um, yeah, so I also wanted to say that um, there are, you know, there, there are these test nets, which are basically, basically tend to be nexus of activity, uh, like say at the moment at Serenkeby that was wrapped up before, where you can actually see serious action going on in terms of like number of transactions, people deploying all sorts of stuff there. And so it would be uh, good, I mean, if it's possible to get that kind of network to be running on this uh, change to just show that it's actually working. Um. Yeah, and I feel like that's that, that's really valuable, but it's maybe like a step ahead. Like, is there, I guess that's a question I'm not sure, but like, is there value to having like a smaller public testnet before using like a, you know, forking one of the larger ones? Yeah, I think we should have a, a phased approach. Okay. Yeah. And then the step after that would, would be to get into a little pattern testnet. Hey, sorry, you kind of cut out there. Uh, so the step after Rick just said would be to get it into a YOLO style testnet. And then the step after that would be to put it into ROM. Yeah, so right now we're kind of like that the pre YOLO step. I think you know in the over the next couple of weeks we can do a sort of 1559 style YOLO testnet. Um, and the question there is do we want it to be a proof of work testnet? It seemed like yes, based on testing all the code paths. Does anyone have like a strong objection to that? 
Okay. Uh, I'd say. Uh, yeah. Cool. So proof of work, kind of early test net. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? That, and, and I think you know, like, it seems like there's definitely like a month or so of work, and we can have another call after that. But like, um, you know, just reaching out to the large users, uh, having the spec updates. Uh, and, and just the clarification for uh, the transaction pools and, and the increments, uh, setting up a test net. Uh, and then obviously there's all the research uh, Barnabé and, and Tim Roughgarden are working on as well in parallel. Um, is anything else missing from this? Okay. I think that's good until next time. And then after, after that stage, then it's the getting more clients to yeah. adopt, yeah. but we don't want to do that yet. So. Oh. That's good for uh, Mika says 2017, 27.18 is also like a thing we should be thinking about. Uh, uh, does anyone, this is probably just a throwing out there in the, in the air question. Does anyone have a sense for how close it would, how long it would take to get the transaction envelope EIP into a YOLO testnet? Basically adding it to like, the current implementations, right? Yeah, I, I, how, how long would it take for us to get implementations or things into the point that we could deploy it as part of a YOLO? As part of, so, uh, would it include would EIP 1559 or would it be on the base? No, it would just be the transaction envelope. Just what is YOLO? That's the, that's the uh, test net or retest net that Peter and the Go, the Go Ethereum team made. Oh. Okay. That's what they're that's what they're using for integration. Right. The, Basically for, free test net. I think it would take about a week or two, um, if that was my focus to get that implemented and go Ethereum. Yeah, two weeks for Bezo, I would say. Okay. Uh if we do that, then it's pretty reasonable to start targeting for Berlin in my To target 27.18 or 15.59? 27.18. Okay. Um, do you think we should do that now? Like, I feel it might be valuable to just set up the test nets with our current implementation because it, it already took a lot of debugging to get them to work. And we might be making some other pretty major changes based on, you know, feedback from, from large users. Um, so given that does it make sense to hold off, you know, kind of these large spec changes for now, except I guess this sort of increment sp change, which, uh, which is a small one and, and actually makes things run smoother. Um, but to kind of put 2718 and, and the potential transition period change on hold until we have more data. Um, I wouldn't put the 2718 into the, into the 1559 implementation okay. until until that it's 2718 is on some kind of you know, test net. So it should be a separate, it should be a separate, uh, okay. so a separate fork that then is trying to get in at that, trying to be included in, a, in an upcoming. Got it. Um, and then one, once it's, that's been accepted, then we can go back and do the 1559. But if okay. this, we start on getting 2718 in, into what it will be, implemented, then the sooner we can have 1559 up. Okay. So I just want to draw attention to Micah's comment, um, where he mentions that Peter from uh, the Geth team would like to see that implemented with the second transaction type, not just the legacy type. Yeah, so we can have 2718 implemented, but not like on YOLO, but not in mainnet, and then wait until there is something to include, but we can still have it implemented and in the form of what it would be like when it goes to mainnet that the 1559 team can adopt. Right, right. What, what, what um, everyone's talking about, James, is that you can't just put in, you know, we're being thorough. You can't just have 2718 by itself. You need 2718 or 2711 in order for 2718 to actually be work. You need the second type. And I'm just wondering, is that like out of scope for what we're talking about right now? Well, I think it's, uh, it's presumably all the same people, so we might as well talk yeah. about it. Got it. But, but it is out of scope, yes.
you have to have a segment type to be able to even have transaction envelopes be implemented. Well, Not for the strictly, but to demonstrate yeah. its purpose. To have it to verify that it actually is safe and that it works, right? If you just deploy uh, 2718 by itself, you just have this weird sort of vestigial thing. You need uh, 1718 plus so the actual new transact another, you need to have two envelopes. And, and what I, and, uh, to, cause it's relevant now, the thing that was confusing to me about uh, 2718 was it wasn't clear to me how it treated the transaction pool. It just sort of acted like the two envelopes were equivalent, which I think more, more times than not, that's not gonna be the case. Yeah, so I, I wanna be clear here that I'm not talking about mainnet, where the stuff that you're talking about, how 20, like Peter and, and 2718 and another transaction type going into mainnet, all of those things need to be verified. But going into YOLO, which is the pre-test net that is used for testing client integration, we could put the just put the transaction envelopes onto that. So at least the 1559 implementers can implement it and then test it and then have that be part of what's. I, I think we could probably put in a dummy second envelope. If for some reason it's too hard to implement, my inclination would be to do 2718 and 2711 at the same time. If there's some reason why we can't do that, uh, as from an engineering perspective, then we should come up with a dummy shim for 2711, but I can't imagine that's significantly easier from an engineering perspective. Yeah, because that, because is a, that is a, um, the changes that 1559 is going to, uh, the reason I'm getting into this is the changes that 1559 will need to make in order to adopt 2718 is a future bottleneck. So if we can get 2718 to a point where it's, uh, it is moving forward and, and well specified and the clients all agree and it gets to the it's on Yolo's testnet stage then the work of redoing 1559 to use that makes sense because we have what it would eventually be paired. Yeah I agree with all of that I, I think that they're two separate I think that 1559 and 2718 are separate the question is what goes with 2718 since we're basically excluding 1559 from that list yeah, and, and either 2711 or a dummy a dummy transaction that was only going to work on yolo would also be fine yeah i think that makes sense yeah and just in terms of priorities do because like rick said it's kind of the same people working on this stuff um should we get the 1559 testnet up and running kind of before getting this Yodo 2718, assuming there's not teams that can do it in parallel? Uh, what is the uh, Ian and Abdel kind of thing? Because I, I, I would go with what they would want to tackle first. Well, there's like, so first of all, just like the increment change to the spec. So I think that's probably the, the highest priority because it's, it's, uh, it's like a small change that has a big impact, but then basically setting up a proof of work test net with, uh, with 1559 as is specified right now. Um, how long is, is that a long process with the minimal changes? I and mean, I don't want to make the decision for, I, I don't have the enough, I don't have the enough information on implementations and stuff, I think. To make that decision. I'm just bringing the point of there is this future bottleneck that we can get ahead of. And so we should. Right. Yeah. I guess I, it's not even clear to me if I would be the one doing 2718 um, since it is, you know, a separate EIP. But yeah, I don't know exactly how we should prioritize that. The immediate focus would be the changes that Tim um, just iterated. Yeah, and my bias would also be towards getting the 1559 network up like before and, and uh, you know, getting that to work because if there's bugs found there, like I think it's a higher priority, at least, you know, for, for us, like for the 1559 kind of effort 
to fix the bugs in the spec. Um, and I don't know, and, and maybe kind of other, if other people really want to push 2718, they can start working on the, on the test net as well. Yeah. yeah and I don't, that sounds good. And I don't know how it's funded amongst the various implementers, but I mean, we're definitely only at Vulcanize. We're definitely only working on 1559 just as a, as a practical matter. So uh, wherever, however that other teams handle that, I mean, I think that's on a per team basis, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, and, and I think for us at Pegasus, it's just kind of the same. Like, you know, we want to focus on 1559 and, and kind of put the bulk of our efforts there. And obviously, if 2718 ends up being a part of that, you know, we'll support it and we'll do that. But we, we definitely can't be like champions for that. Um, And I guess with two minutes to go, uh, uh, the idea of like funding and accelerating development was the last thing on the agenda. Um, I know Alexei, you, you kind of mentioned that at the beginning. I don't know if you had some specific thoughts to give some context, like it seems like a lot of people would like to see 1559 happen quicker and, and, and potentially, you know, provide funding to accelerate that. Um, my biggest question, like for the people here is just, what do we see as the biggest bottlenecks in terms of like our execution speed? Um, would money actually help there? Um, yeah, but I don't know if, if it's, I don't know. I can stay on like 10, 15 minutes if people want to chat about that, but if everyone has to drop in one minute, I, it's probably too big of a can of worms to- We, we could open. probably make it optional, yes. If anybody wants yeah. to stay on, we can yeah. discuss this. I'll have to go, but I'll just make my two cents. I, I think that the way that I mean, I don't feel like development in my whole time working on this project, I don't think that developers have been or engineering has been what's slow. I think it's been communicating to the community that you need to have research, like basic research, like Tim Roughgarden type stuff. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, the other guy's name is French. I'm not, I don't want to mangle it. Uh, stuff going on. I think that getting people to understand that that has to be funded and that has to happen is like a huge milestone. And then in a similar vein, what James was talking about earlier about someone has to like go, you know, go door to door and make sure that integrations happen and funding that. And I think that, you know, those two things getting funded is way more important, frankly. I mean, we'll figure out how to do the engineering, but, but from a financial standpoint, but getting the community to understand that we're not, you know, we're not incrementing a, a variable. We're not incrementing a constant here. We're, we're really changing a lot of a large swath of what's going on. Um, and that requires doing a lot more than just engineering. I, I think paying for that is where the money should go. And on that note, I have to go. So thanks everyone. And uh, I'll talk to you all later. Thank you. I have to drop as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Okay, let's see who who, uh, who is left. <laughs> uh, Hi, Alexi. Okay. Hi. Let's see who is left. Yeah, I can stay. Thomas, you can stay. I'll stick okay. around as well. It's too late anyway, so. <laughs> right, it's too late. Yeah, so I just uh, kind of wanted to us to discuss a tiny bit because I know that Twitter is, is basically a really bad platform for trying to explain these things and people get offended very quickly. Like uh, yesterday there was, you know, they started like uh, lashing at each other and it's very bad. Um, you know, somebody said the wrong word or like whatever. So, but I, I basically what I picked out, picked out from the recent conversation is that they, uh, they seemed to be this sort of expectation that, okay, now we threw some money in, there's Gitcoin grant, you know, you got 60 grand, whatever, how much, I don't remember, but where's the, where's the result, right? How, when, it, no, it's not like that, actually. They basically say like, when is this gonna happen? What is the blockers? Which is all reasonable questions. Um, and yes, but yeah, we, we need a way to actually explain as Rick said, that where, what are the expensive bits of it? Like it reminds me on the, on the state rent project where eventually the, the reason why I decided to stop doing it is because I discovered that 
we would need a lot of this door-to-door -door people to go doing really unexciting work of just basically just having meetings with people all the time, trying to figure out who can migrate, how they migrate, and all sorts of stuff. And obviously, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we can sort of address this because we, we don't really have a lot of people from the other side of the, um, from the other side of the argument. Uh, what anybody else thinks? I, I agree that like there's a lot of uh, communications and, and outreach that needs to happen. I don't think that's an impossible problem. Um, I guess it kind of depends like how you look at it. Like I'm not an engineer. So for me, the engineering stuff looks harder than having tons of meetings. Um, and I guess like vice versa. Um, I think with regards to like the community's expectations, two things I'm a bit, uh, uh, I guess anxious about is one explaining the uncertainty of 1559. So, you know, a lot of people have, you know, brought up a bunch of issues today with the EAP. To me, it's still not like a done deal. And I think there's a perception in the community that, you know, this is just, it's all downhill from here. Um, and, and, and it's really not. So I think articulating that and, and making it clear, um, and, and because that also translates to funding, right? So like if the people, you know, funding the Bitcoin grant are kind of mad that it's not moving fast enough, uh, they'll be really mad if, you know, they find out there's like a fatal flaw. And I think it's really important to manage that expectation. Um, but they, yeah. also, uh, they, they also don't, I mean, you know, you look at the Bitcoin grant, it's, it says 60 or oh yeah, whatever. How, how much did it? Yeah, happen? I think Where, it's, I think it's 80,000 80, because the price of Ether went up. But okay, it was 80, like 60, yeah. Okay, because somebody gave an Ether. Okay, 80,000. Sort of, okay, that's a sort of reasonable amount of money. But then how many people can you, you know, hire with this kind of money? And yes. for how long? Then when you start yeah. thinking of these terms, it actually turns out that it's not that much. Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it sort of underscores the point that the Gitcoin grant is still not capable uh, in, in completely funding this project. And this is what people need to understand that there's much more. If you really want to make it sort of happen at, uh, kind of, you know, at, at a decent pace uh, with people not getting stressed about like doing 10 jobs at the same time. Yeah, you do need to basically splash a little bit more money into this. And who is going to splash this money? This is the question. Uh. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, yeah, some people have, you know, brought this up and, and reached out and I've, I've been trying to, 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 to chat with some of them. Uh, and, and one thing, like you said, that I've, I've made clear is like this $80,000. So right now, how things are funded, right? There's this $80,000 grant, which will probably mostly go to vulcanize, you know, modulo some other, some other things. Um, Consensus is, you know, we have me and, and Abdel and Kareem that we can put kind of part time on this. Uh, but obviously, there's an opportunity cost there. We have paid customers, and you know, that's always like a prioritizing prioritization thing. The EF has people working on this, you know, pretty much full time. So Barnabé, um, which is which is great. And then Tim Roughgarden has been paid kind of independently by somebody else. Um, but this means that you know the bulk of the work is happening by like one or two people by the EF, uh, you know, and then one or two developers on both the Vulcanize and and, and our side, um, and and it's you know it, it will move along, but it will be you know I'm, I'm not even sure slow is the right word, um, but you know it'll be like not as quick as it could be. Um, yes, and also the, the, there is another issue here is that. You know, sometimes uh, there are certain things that need to happen before you 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 reach your kind of full full speed. So you need to do. Sometimes you have to do some preparatory work. An example is this uh, transaction enveloping things, right? I, it probably, if it existed before, this the the things would be a bit easier. And so, um, what might be uh, interesting is to have uh, this understanding that you know. It kind of you not only have to wait for one year for all the work to happen but for all the all the things to fall into their places all, all the pieces to fall into the places like uh you know when you launch a test net you cannot uh you know you cannot put let's say extra hundred thousand dollars and make sure that the test net needs to be run for like 10 times shorter than that so you actually have to wait for yeah something yeah to happen. And, uh, and i think <laughs> 
I think that's why, you know, like personally, I've been like a, a reticent about going back on like all core devs and discussing this again, because there's just like known issues with the EAP that we're still, you know, addressing and whether you probably need more than one implementation to like start addressing yeah. them. Like, I think it's been helpful to have base you and, and, and get kind of disagree on stuff and, and fix those. But like, we definitely don't necessarily need everybody to have this at the top of their priority list. Uh, because we might find some other issues with it. So yeah, it's, it's like this weird in between period where. And, and also what just uh, Thomas is asking on the, yeah. I know it's a sort of joke, but it's actually not a joke that. Yeah, if, uh, yeah. It, yeah I mean, I'm, of course, uh, this, 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 we should not uh, undersell ourselves. And, uh, and, and then it applies to pretty much everybody in, in the core development. Uh, yeah that uh, the, the, our work does cost money and it probably yep. costs a lot of money. So uh, it, it, is, it is okay to expect to be paid for these things. And uh, I, I, know, I don't know how exactly, but the expectation is not, you know, it, could, it should be there. The, yeah. Go ahead, James. Uh, I was just gonna say that a, an opportunity for public to, for others to contribute funding in a meaningful way would be to provide of funding to help the other clients implement 1559. So Nethermind, uh, Open Ethereum. Open Ethereum by, it, the, if there was a, the, the sooner those happen, the sooner it can happen. And those teams are already over, right? The, all of the client teams are busy working. So to get resources to build, to implement them in all the clients would necessarily make that the time yeah, because basically what happens is that every uh, all the development teams at the moment they have their own priorities they have own agenda because partly some of them basically uh, are thinking about how they're gonna you know get some money to pay their people right like it was was rick was saying it on on on, on twitter is that okay some of them actually have to pay out of their own pocket to 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 make things happen because they actually sort of like because they have a bit of money or because they, they hope that they're gonna make something out of it in the future. Uh, but just basically piling onto that and expecting things to go faster, that's the, uh, you know, that's not gonna happen. I think uh, that has to be sort of appreciation and respect for, uh, for people and, and, you know, expecting to throw in 30 grand and things happening in a month, it's not realistic. So if you have, if you basically throw in half a million, then you probably have can have these uh, <laughs> much much bigger expectations. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I, does that so? If if someone came in and did a did an implementation into Nethermind, uh, separate from the from the team, like I'll give to the, to the Nethermind team, does that fit what you're saying or not what you're saying, Alexi? I mean, it depends, and I mean, obviously, I don't want to talk. For, uh, for too much, but it depends on uh, the ability to do that also depends on the code structure and how it's structured. It's like sometimes in some of the implementations, it has to be pretty much the people who are owning that to be make, to making changes. In some implementations, it's easier to just uh, come from the side and, and propose the implementation. For example, what we are trying to do in our implementation, we're trying to split everything as much as possible so that to allow people to come and do things on the side. Uh, but yeah, I don't know about the others. Um. And I guess it's also worth noting, like this is kind of a weird EIP because, you know, like for normal EIPs client, you know, there's some team that's usually not a client developer that kind of does a POC implementation and then they bring it to all core devs and then the clients all kind of implement it, you know, quote unquote for free um, and, 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 and it gets kind of moved up. Um, and this one is kind of weird because it's like applied R&D in a way. So uh, the, there needs to be like more early implementation and it's also a much larger change than other EIPs. Um, and it's not clear where like the boundary is from like, yeah, paying like a third party to provide a reference implementation and then paying all the clients to prioritize that on the roadmaps um, and, and the level of like alignment you need, right? Like um, how do we get funds for like all the clients to prioritize this? Um, and is that like the model we want where like uh, 
if there's like this huge change that happens, then we basically need to pay for N implementations. And by we, I guess, like the community needs to find a way to pay for these N implementations. Um, I mean, if, if we wanted to eventually come to a much healthier kind of model of development, uh, so that goes back to what we'll be discussing again in July as well. If we want to come to a much healthier model of de development, then there has to be expectation that any work uh, which is which needs to be done done the money has to come from somewhere so far i as far as i know that the 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 core developers haven't figured out the way to finance their development completely without some kind of subsidies and therefore for now the subsidies have to be applied yeah so i think like we already know we have a couple of milestones to hit like the first one is like freezing the specs, then we know that we have a YOLO testnet. We know that after this, we want to have a proof of work testnet or something. And then we know that other clients will need to implement. So a good way also to manage the expectation of a community would be to have like a reasonable, let's say roadmap with some, some kind of timeline. Because currently like there's a lot of momentum around EIP 1559. Like a lot of people even on Twitter have said, uh, oh, if money is the issue, we can always like throw more. But um, it, it, like, a good way to say okay you can give us now but we might we don't we don't really need to throw like a half a million dollar on it currently is to have this sort of timeline and to say this will be useful later on uh, once we yeah I, I guess after four months if people don't really see improvement or for the community improvement anyways is is very binary like either it's on the mainnet or not whatever is happening in between like they they don't really see as improvement so yeah, having like a yeah, so time. The, the thing about this uh, kind of drip drip uh, fin financing is also problematic, as I think Tim mentioned on Twitter, is that uh, the reason I'm talking about throwing in for half a million dollars is because uh, in, if, you, if you know that the money is there, then you can actually uh, really hire somebody to do the work for a reasonable time. You don't right. have to uh, keep everybody on sort of zero hour contracts and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. with saying that every any time when the money runs out, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and I think um, that's that's exactly the situation we're kind of in with the Gitcoin grant to be sure, right? Like we have, you know, like a not insignificant amount of money, but you don't know if it's gonna last you three months, six months, 12 months, right? And, and obviously the rate at which you spend, you know, you, yeah. you kind of want to be conservative on, on it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that's why, I mean, that's why sort of the model wor which works the best is either you have a very reliable counterparty, like uh, let's say Ethereum Foundation, uh, that basically has a contract with you or something like this, that they give you money as long as you don't do anything really stupid. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, or you have a pool of money in front of you. And, and I think, yeah, back to Barnabas' point, this, what I find, I think the hardest is like, yeah, how do you, you know, for those intermediate milestones, like setting up a proof of work test net and whatnot, like what's, what's the right amount of funding and of, you know, like, should we fund client implementations for all the clients to join the test net, which might not work, right? And if not, how, how many do we fund and how do we choose it? Like, I mean, you, you, yeah. don't, need, you need, don't need to be so fine grained. I mean, this project is not so huge that you have to be like obsessing about fine grained details. So what you could do simply is that, uh, let's say that you say, okay, for, for this to happen, we need, uh, you choose the implementations. Let's say we need to go Ethereum, never mind whatever, open Ethereum and what else? I mean, choose them. And let's say everybody should hey, get one developer on each team implementing this and get to make sure that everything kind of works uh, for how many months, whatever. And that's basically it. I mean, really rough uh, idea. Uh, so, the, but you, then you know that at, in each team, there is one person doing this job. And of course they can do some other things at the same time. You cannot stop that, but at, at least uh, the, the money is allocated. You know that it's there. Uh, that's how I that's would say. I mean, if this project was for $5 million, then of course you have to have an extra scrutiny about you know where exactly this money is going. But for I mean even like if it's a half a million, I don't see the point of obsessing over the details. Yeah. And 
I guess Justin has a comment around like, you know, the precise funding needs for fast tracking this. Like, I, I'm i not sure, is there like a way to fast track it? Which one? Like, it seems, I, I guess, I don't know, I pass like one developer per team. I think there might be like diminishing returns and I'm not sure if like the funding actually fast tracks things or just puts them at like a normal pace. Like we, yeah. The, the things that would uh, fast track would be funding the community outreach stuff so that there is a group of people that are ready to go out and make sure people are adopting. Uh, other things would be having bounties for forking MetaMask and put in, in, in implementing 1559 transaction support. So you just put up a list of major wallets and major things and say, hey, anyone that does Anyone that, that implements 1559 into it, it's this bounty. Um, and then the last one would be after this kind of round of, of R&D that's happening for the next month or so, when it turns into all the clients need to implement, giving them support through whatever, however it is for each client team is the kind of the last I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's uh, the the issue with the um, kind of with the bounties or something like this. But I I just like to simplify this um, to because essentially, if you say that uh, there is a money to pay, let's say one developer in each team for six months, right? That's it. You know, and they suppose this developer supposed to be doing EIP sixteen fifteen fifty nine. They can do basically if they if they're not coding all the time, they can do other things, testing, write more testing, doing spinning out test nets, talking to each other, whatever. Yeah. I mean, whatever they could be, whatever they can do to make this to make sure that it happens really. And if they're doing yeah. something else, as I said, it's fine as well. You know, you know, would you be like really <laughs> upset if they spend some money on improving performance of their client as well? <laughs> yeah. And I think I. I at least from our perspective, like there's value in saying one developer is like, you know, paid to do this and, and it can help just like prioritize 1559 about other stuff on a day to day thing. Um, obviously, like I'd be curious to chat with other client teams um, to, to see that, but um, and, and I'm happy to take that action item to like reach out like Thomas, I know you have a bunch of comments in the chat and I know you can't talk right now, but I can set up a call maybe with like Nethermind. Uh, I don't know, Alexei, if you want TurboGet to, to be part of this, but to just, yeah, talk with the different client teams, see what's like a reasonable amount of engineering work and, um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, can we just get like one, one client, one person on each client team to put this at the top of their priority list and then the other kind of more ops work uh, as well. Um, and what would be just like a rough amount for that? Okay. Somebody needs to ch save the chat uh, before we go. It'll save. It'll save. Uh, I'm recording on Zoom, so it'll save. Oh, okay. And, uh, sure. I'll make sure I'll send it to, to Griffin. So Griffin does a transcript uh, okay. based on the Zoom recording. So I'll send him the chat as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, I think I've, yeah. I'm also doing the notes for detailed notes for it, and I have the chat saved with me. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to take that as an action item to follow up with the different client teams next week and see what are the, you know, possible, uh, like what, what we think makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, anything else anyone wanted to discuss? I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just just oh, one, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Just one last thing I want I wanted to throw out. Uh, in the beginning of the call, we were discussing about having the transparency on the funds. So um, I have just created the sheet uh, for reference and we would be like sharing it with people who are interested. It will include all kind of uh, outgoing transaction will be recorded here. Okay, let me just share my screen so it's in the recording. 
Okay, so we can see here, um, yeah, like we said, the two only transactions so far have been for Vulcanize. Um, yeah. Cool. Anything else? Okay, then, uh, yeah. So I think there's a pretty huge amount of work to get done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so some changes on the spec, um, trying to, to get a, a testnet uh, with proof of workout, um, following up the conversations around uh, 2718, uh, there's some R&D work, and then the whole funding discussion. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, and I think it makes sense to probably have another one of these calls in like a month to give an update on, on all those things. Yeah, thank you very much, bye. Of course. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Al.